race has been rescheduled until May the 10th. Hey, if you pay attention to those ESPN telecasts, you know that this is the ultimate motorsports attraction. Welcome to Daytona, USA. I'm Dave Despain with Benny Parsons, and we're here for the Winston Cup mid-season pit stop. An hour-long look back at what has been an amazing season. Benny, I'm going to put you on the spot right off the top. What's the single thing that has dazzled you most in the first half of this year? Uh, probably the dominance of Jeff Gordon. You know, folks, when we, when we talk about stock car racing, Winston Cup racing, we talk about competition. Cars, nose to tail, side by side, three abreast. But yet this kid has won 50% of the races. So did we pick a good place to do this show or what? Here you've got Jeff Gordon's Daytona 500 winner sitting here with all the dirt and grime from the big race back in February. And coincidentally, that's where we're going to kick things off. Let's take a quick run back through the first half of the season. The season opening Daytona 500 is always emotional, but this year's was real Cinderella stuff. Gordon leading a Hendrick sweep of the top three shortly after car owner Rick Hendrick was diagnosed with leukemia. Dale Jarrett then went on a tear, winning back-to-back -back races, building a healthy point lead, while Gordon knocked out wins at the rate of one every other race, including a fuel mileage victory at the debut of the new California Speedway. It was Jeff Burton who christened the new Texas Motor Speedway with his first career victory, and he maintained that momentum to remain a contender at halftime. Changes in the dictated dimension of spoilers and valences were perhaps less frequent than in the height of rule change fever, though still frequent enough to keep the drivers and the fans talking about it. Those drivers, of course, contributed the occasional moment of on-track controversy to divert attention from NASCAR's constant quest for a level playing field. When Mark Martin won Sonoma, he broke a losing streak dating to October 95. A week later, he made it two in a row with a win at Talladega. The momentum carried him through a streak of eight top five finishes. Talladega, meanwhile, one of only two real bright spots for Dale Earnhardt in the first half, second to Martin there, another top five last week. But his winless streak remains the longest of his storied career. Ultimately, the championship is what this series is all about, and the contenders hit the occasional bump in the road. Bobby Labonte, fifth in the points when he was pitched into the concrete at Dover. Jarrett lost the lead to consecutive blown engines at Charlotte and Dover. Defending champ Terry Labonte tumbled from second to fourth in points when he ran over debris at Michigan and hit the wall with a car he felt confident could win the race. And then, of course, last Saturday, it was Martin's turn. The huge wreck at the end of the Pepsi 400 dropped him to third in the standings and lifted Labonte back into second place. Add to all of that any number of spectacular, heartwarming, promising, and heart-stopping moments of drama and excitement, the stuff that makes Winston Cup racing the fastest-growing sport in America. And through it all, like the Energizer Bunny, Jeff Gordon just kept winning and winning and winning and winning until he had won an amazing seven races out of the first 16. Here are your mid-season point standings. Terry moves within 54 of his teammates. The Ford guys, Mark and DJ, just 12 points apart. And Earnhardt ties Burton for the last spot in the top five. ESPN's NASCAR Winston Cup midseason pit stop is brought to you by the more than 1,600 AutoZone stores across America. AutoZone, the best parts in auto parts. In 1993, Rusty Wallace won 10 races. Great season, though there were enough hard times along the way to cost him the Winston Cup championship. Let's back up. 1987. 11 times Dale Earnhardt went to victory lane. He won the championship by 489 points. That's like winning a race by three laps. Back a couple of more years, 85. Bill Elliott winning everything in sight. Daytona 500, Winston Million, most popular driver. 11 races in a season. He missed one thing. Darrell Waltrip got the title. Ah, yeah, Waltrip. 
and the remarkable streak of 1981 and 82, DW's first two seasons with Junior Johnson. He won 24 of 61 races, 12 each in the 81 and 82 campaign. The single season victory record that stands to this day, and DW did it two years running. And thus, we gain a little perspective on the pace at which Jeff Gordon is winning races. 15 events this year, he's won seven, 17 to go. If he keeps up the pace and wins seven more, Waltrip's record isn't just broken, it's shattered. And Jeff Gordon puts a mark on the wall that may be up there forever. Just the kind of thing one might do en route to establishing a dynasty. Tell you what, Benny, when a kid wins races, do I dare call him a kid? When a kid wins races at the rate he's winning races, the comparisons to the all-time greats are inevitable. You start to hear people now comparing him to Richard Petty. How do you feel when you hear that? I saw Richard Petty in his prime. I saw David Pearson in his prime. Darrell Walter. I was around when Darrell Walter ran his first race and went on to win a lot of races. I saw him, and Jeff Gordon is every bit as good as any of those guys. And you know what? He can not only drive, he can talk. We had a lot of fun when we sat down for this interview. I want to take you back to that famous sign on the wall in the shop that runs down through the list of goals, winner, contender, champion. And the last one is dynasty. And I bet that's a tough one to live with because how do you define that? I'm wondering what your definition of a, of a Winston Cup dynasty in this era would be. You know, I think to be a, a dynasty, to get that check mark, there's no telling how many years ahead of us we have to look forward to to possibly get that check mark. I think, you know, we're going to have to, to look back and, you know, over a, a decade or more, you know, of what our accomplishments are to be able to consider that. To me, Richard Petty and what they did was a dynasty. Um, who can ever live up to that? Will that check mark ever even be checked off? Who knows? We, we don't have that answer, but we can certainly try. You do this year to year or at your point in your career, 25 years old, do you look 10 years down the road and think, you know, I'm here now, I've, I've made it in this game, now I can start thinking in a little longer terms, or is it still too early? You know, maybe I'm young, I don't know, maybe I don't look far enough ahead, but, you know, it's just like each season, I, I try to look one race at a time, and yeah, sure, preparation goes into races down the stretch and, and how to be prepared for the whole season, but. As a driver, I really try to look at it, you know, one race at a time. And, and you know, my whole life has sort of been that way, uh, you know, look at one year at a time and one race at a time. So for me to look, you know, years down the road, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to think about that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying what we're doing now. We're winning races. Uh, you know, I don't want to think too far in advance and get too far out ahead of myself because also in this sport, things change in a hurry. I mean, anything can happen at any time. You know, California could have been my last win. Um, you know, who knows how many more there are to win or, you know, if I'll ever win another one again. So that's why I kind of live, you know, my life that way also. This championship sitting out there now half a season away, because you've won all those races, people are starting to say things like, well, it's yours to lose, mm -hmm. that you're the guy who's controlling the championship chase and uh, that it's yours for the taking and, and thus yours to lose. Do you see it that way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think our, our you know, biggest rival is ourselves right now. I mean, um, I, as far as looking at performance, you know, we've got the performance. I mean, and I feel like we can keep, keep this level of performance throughout the rest of the season, but, you know, we don't want to take it to the edge because when you do try to win seven races you take chances and uh, you know we like I said we don't necessarily need to win seven more races this season to try to break this you know this 12 you know it's always about these numbers we just we want the, the points numbers at the end of the season because uh, that accumulates to a Winston Cup championship. Did I hear a hint in there that you may want to be a little more conservative in the second half, or did I read that into what you said? I don't want to change anything, and it's hard to change Jeff Gordon on the racetrack. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we go out every weekend to try to win the race, but uh, I think one thing that I have done different this year, even though I've been more aggressive, uh, I feel like I've been smarter also. And when I've, when I've got to take a third-place finish, you know, or a fourth or fifth-place finish, you know, I take it where 
Uh, you know, in the past, I may have gotten frustrated because I had a winning car. Now I fall into fifth, and it blows up in our face. You know, so you know there there are things that that I can certainly control out there um, that that can still keep that consistency up and uh, without winning races. But we're going to try to win races. I guarantee you that. You know, Benny, when you listen to the guy, he seems to have a pretty good handle on all the pressure from the media and the fans and the rest of that, especially for a guy 25 years of age. But i got to think that's the toughest part of the job. Well, it's got to be. I mean, we're the guy that if anyone runs Jeff Gordon away from the sport, it will be us, the media. What did you tell me that right now Jeff Gordon has 200 requests per week for interviews? 200. And the fans, he can't go out to dinner. He can't do anything because the fans love him to death. Kind of like Elvis Presley. Well, I hope we don't drive him away because I sure like watching him drive race cars. When we come back, though, we're going to talk about a guy who is in very serious contention for this championship and is going to try to take it away from Gordon. I'm talking, of course, about Mark Martin. We'll have a great visit with him coming up. And a look at that painful racing reality, the biggest wrecks of 1997 when we continue. We're back at Daytona, USA. Hey, this place is cool. It's fun. There's a lot to do. I'm going to challenge Parsons to the video racing games after we're finished here. But right now, we've got to talk about wrecks. How many cars did you tear up in your career? Well, let's see. you got to average two or three a year, and I did it for 19 years. So I don't want to add it up. <laughs> That's ugly arithmetic, isn't it? You buy that theory that I've heard a time or two that you got to crash once in a while to, to know if you're going fast enough or to know where the edge is? No, no. I, I, don't, I think that a good race car driver knows where the edge is because it's the seat of his pants. It's the feel that he has. He knows where the edge is, and he never quite gets to it. You know, no matter how good you are, seems like once in a while you're going to get caught up in it. Let's take a look at the big hits of 1997. Well, started Daytona. I thought Earnhardt getting upside down on the backstretch might be the most replayed wreck of all time until we got to Atlanta, and Steve Grissom had that unbelievable fire-involved crash. Ted Musgrave also had a hard hit at Atlanta. How about Trickle into Bodine at Dover? Mm, that one hurts to watch. Ricky Craven's hard hit at Texas hurt for real. The injuries there marring his debut with the Hendrick organization. Texas and all the criticism. First, there was the monster crash on the first lap that involved about half the field. Later, of course, Rusty Wallace getting in trouble, Ernie Irvin checking up, and Jeff Gordon plowing him from behind in one that folks are still talking about. Not all the stock car involved crashes involve stock cars. Robbie Gordon on the ground and on fire at Indianapolis. The burn on his leg kept him out of his Winston Cup car for a couple of races. And then, of course, there was Michigan. Gordon in practice under Earnhardt, getting loose, taking Burton and Trickle into the wall leaving Burton with injuries that hamper him still at midseason. Finally, the big Dick Trickle, Ward Burton, and Mark Martin tangle that literally ended the first half of the season. Last lap last week at Daytona. What a mess. Watching those wrecks remind me of Daytona 1975. David Pearson is leading the race. He spins out. And I could not believe David Pearson spun out. I, all the way down the backstretch, it never dawned on me I was going to win the Daytona 500. It's, wow, David Pearson spun out. <laughs> Amazing. <thing>. Amazing. <laughs> We're going to shift gears here. We're going to talk about a guy who has managed to dodge most of the metal bending in 1997. He has also ended a long losing streak, one, two in a row, and jumped into serious contention for the championship but most impressive i thought was this interview when i sat down to talk with mark martin he's got some good things to say you may want to correct me on this but my impression of mark martin is that you do basically the same thing every week you show up with the same goal and the chips fall you don't get down when you do badly you don't get way up when you win you approach racing on a very even keel basis is that a fair assessment that's a fair assessment uh, inside i do get down but i try not to show it it's it's detrimental to the race team and uh, you know and, and but the race fans don't like to see uh, grown men cry <laughs> and uh, but now you know i don't like to make a big deal out of the success part of it you know i mean i try to keep that on an even keel as well you know and try not to make too much i mean it's it's great and it's good for valvoline and you know all our sponsors and cummins and all those folks but 
you know, and we want to do the right thing, but, you know, uh, we're not the only folks on the racetrack, you know, uh, when we're doing good. And, and we are out there even when we're not doing good. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's important to keep things fairly well even for me. It was real noticeable this season because you were continuing to battle that losing streak and you just kept hammering on it, hammering on it, telling everybody how good that race team was, even though the results weren't there. And then all of a sudden, bingo, two in a row. Anything different, anything you can put your finger on and say, that's the reason we were able to turn it around at that point in the season? Well, no, um, nothing really different. Um, same race team, same job being done. Uh, those guys are uh, championship material. They were last fall, and they, you know, they came out of the box this year a little stronger yet. The performance at Daytona in the 500 was superior to any Daytona 500 performance we'd ever uh, you know, put forth. Uh, the, the results were lackluster, seventh, with the, but we did lead the most laps, led as many laps as we had total, you know, before on a restrictor plate race, you know, all together. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, it's been it's been right there and it's just kind of things come in spells and it's our turn right now and we're on a roll and and that role really has uh, sustained itself real nicely since you won the back-to-back -back races i mean your your progress in the points has been very impressive to the point where people are saying wow all of a sudden mark martin's a contender mark martin's been a contender for as long as i can remember but does it feel different now being this close to it this point in the season does anything in your mindset or the team's mindset change and you start thinking, championship, we've got a real shot at this thing? Well, uh, last year we were, at this point, we were thinking championship, not winning it, but trying to be in the top five. I mean, it's still the same. If you're 20th, you're still thinking points, trying to get to 12th. Or if you're 10th, you're thinking points, trying to get to 5th. It's all the same. It does, just be, the big old number one doesn't change things that much. You know, and we're, as a team, the team as a whole is kind of a low-key kind of race team as well. We don't jump up and beat on our chest when we do good, you know, and we keep our chin up when we don't do well and, and keep working and, and trying to come back and, and get on track. And so, you know, we're not noticed as much as some of these other guys. Uh, um, you know, I watch from time to time, I watch, you know, what's going on in the newspapers and, and everything. and. Uh, we're able to sneak along pretty quietly, and that's basically what we've done in the championship hunt here is, is snuck our way into, into the hunt, and uh, that's fine with us. You know, I'd like to sneak our way right on into that uh, uh, head table in New York at the end of the year. It would mean an awful lot to me to deliver a Winston Cup championship to Jack Ralph. Uh, if I don't hurry up, I'm afraid one of my teammates may beat me to it. No, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. When he's in the mood to talk, I think Mark Martin is the best interview in the Winston Cup garage area. This interview was so good, we had to stretch it across two segments. We're going to hear more from Mark after the commercial break. I want to go win this championship, ultimately, for Jack Ralph. I want to go win each race for what it does to me, for how it makes me feel. You know, and, and, and you know, of course, it's great for the race team and everything. But I'm trying to explain that, you know, I don't lay, lie in the bed at night dreaming of winning that championship. I think about those races, and that's what I think about. I lay in the bed at night and think about how I'm going to win those races. So, uh, you know, I don't know why it's that. It is important to me to win the championship. It's more important to me to win races along the way. I think if we win races along the way, we'll be a contender for the championship. Jack Roush is the guy that I want to deliver a, a championship to. Given what you just said, tell me about the night after Sonoma. Forty-some races of laying there thinking, man, I want the next one. It was almost all in the fog or in a blur because uh, we needed to win the next one, whatever the next one, Talladega. You know, that one was over with, that one was done. Now that one's not important. The one that's important is Talladega. And, you know, your guts start wrapping up tight, figuring out how in the heck can we go win Talladega now. And that's just how I am, you know. As soon as, as soon as the one is behind you, it's not important. It's that next one in front of you that 
you know, that means everything. You know, in racing, I've always immediately forgotten about my accomplishments. You know, and I am that low-key guy. I don't, you know, I, uh, I've accomplished a lot more in racing than I know. Believe me, because I forgot about every race I've won. You know, the only one I can think about is the next one. And, uh, you know, one day when it's all done with and I p pull out a book and it lists all the things that I did in my career, I'm going to say, wow, that's a lot. I didn't realize it at the time that, you know, I was ex as successful as I was. Because I was so in, uh, consumed in, consumed by getting that next result. And by the way, along the, along the way, I didn't have a whole lot of big old fun either because basically, you know, all I wanted to think about was how we're going to get this next one. You know, because these guys are hard to beat. You never beat them. You'll never beat them, ever, unless you think about it and figure. you got to, you know, out-shock them, out-spring them, out-body them. Out, you know, you got to figure out sometime when they're running downforce cars and you're running a speedway or back or forth. or You've got to, you know, I mean, you've always got to be looking for a way to catch everybody looking the other direction. At least that's, that's how I've done it. If I were a psychologist, I'd, I'd put my arm around your shoulder and I'd say, Mark, stop and smell the roses. Appreciate this wonderful thing that's happening to you. Is that hard for you to do? I'm, you know, I'm as happy as I probably will ever be. You know, I mean, I've got everything in the world. I've got a, a Valvoline and Cummins and, and Ford and all these great sponsors. I'm working with Jack Roush, Steve Meal, uh, Dream Come True, Jimmy Finnick. You know, I've got a great uh, Bush program. I've got, uh, you know, I've had a lot of success in the IROC series. Everything is great. I've got, you know, a dream family. I've got, you know, a, a son to, I've got it all. And I probably couldn't expect to be any happier if you, if you gave me anything I wanted. You know, uh, you know, whatever it might be, I can't imagine what it would be, but, you know, I probably couldn't be happier than what I am, but my life is not about having fun. My life is about winning races. That's what it is. And I don't apologize, you know, to my family or to anyone around me. You know, if I make them miserable because that is what my life is about, I'm sorry. But that's what it is. I mean, that's the main thing. It's not going on a vacation or having fun. You know, it's, let's win, man. Let's win this race. Nothing feels better. Nothing. They don't make a drug that good. Benny, I found that to be a pretty eloquent uh, expression, not only of the obsession with winning, but also the sacrifices that that entails. And that's exactly where we are in all the sports today, baseball, football. To win the big game of the World Series or the Super Bowl, you really got to dedicate yourself and focus. And, you know, Mark Martin, he appeals to how many fans has he got? Millions of fans, and they all love him to death. But the people that are closest to him, the three or four people that are really close to him, they really suffer through this. They're the ones that pay the price. But, hey... The prize at the end makes it all worthwhile. That would be the Winston Cup championship, and we're going to talk to more of the title contenders as this NASCAR Winston Cup midseason pit stop continues. There is no other moment like it in Winston Cup racing. The payoff for an entire season of hard work, clinching the Winston Cup championship. Terry Labonte had to race right down to the last lap of the last race last season to make that happen. Well, that was then, and this is now. Labonte as defending champion, doing what he does best, consistently piling up points. There's kind of a symmetry to Labonte's 97 first half. It opened to Daytona, coming through the field from 18th to finish second. We go back there for the halfway race, the Pepsi 400. He qualifies 35th, comes through the field, and finishes second. And in between, listen to the numbers that reflect typical Iceman consistency. 13 top 10s in 16 starts, and only one DNF. Let's talk to him. Let's start with your assessment of your team's performance in the first half. Are you happy with where you are? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think there's uh, uh, some th We did some things very good, I felt like, but we also, you know, wish we would have won a race in the first half of the year. We came close a few times and didn't do that. So that's probably the only thing that was a little disappointing. That's kind of a pattern for you. I mean, winning a lot of races has never been your style. It's the consistency that we all know so much about. So how much does that eat at you when you don't get the win? Well, you know, you don't have an opportunity to win every weekend, so when you have an opportunity, you don't like to miss it, and, uh, and that's happened to us. 
Uh, California two weeks ago was a good example. We really thought we had that one. Felt like we had the car to beat. We came up short. But uh, that's the way it goes. you got to keep doing that. If you can continue to be consistent like that and be competitive, you're going to win some races. One of the rules in racing is no matter how good you are, you've always got to be getting better. That's right. Because everybody else is exactly. getting better. Right. Is this a better race team now than the race team that won the championship at the end of 1996? I don't, I don't know if it's any better. I think it's just as good. I think that the second half of the year it will be, it will be better, you know, because I think we've got some some new cars in the works that we're going to come back with the second time around at some of these racetracks, and I think that's going to improve some things. Traditionally, our team has always been better in the second half of the year for some reason. I don't know why, but every year we've always been that way. I hope it's the case this year. Knowing that going in, do you put more focus on the first half? I mean, do you, tr do you try to change that, get better at the start of the season? You know, I think that the first part of the season and the middle of the season there, if we're close, then I feel good about it because I think we're going to be pretty tough the second part of the year. Final question, how do you stop Jeff Gordon? <laughs> I'll tell you what, they're really on a roll right now, you know, and, and Jeff and Ray really uh, work well together. Uh, they've been tough to beat. And, uh, you know, we thought we had them beat a couple of times, and, and they've still come back on top at the end of the race. So I don't know. Uh, you know, you've seen this with other people in the past over the, over the years that uh, kind of really things are working for them. They kind of get on a roll. They can't seem to make any mistakes, and they win a bunch of races. And, and right now... Jeff and his team are kind of riding that deal, and uh, so I don't know. It's uh, they're going to be tough to beat. I mean, you're not going to go out here and just just start beating them every weekend because they're going to be tough all year long. And we just got to get better. We've got to step it up a little bit and uh, try to beat them. Benny, let me ask you: you see any any weakness there? Any chink in the armor? Or is that guy going to come back and win a second straight championship? Well, he certainly can. I don't. There's not really any weakness there. Good, great race car driver, great cars, just like Jeff Gordon's cars, pit crew. The, the ingredients are all there for Terry Labonte to do exactly what Jeff Gordon's doing. He just got to get on a roll. I'll tell you what, it's going to be fun to watch through the rest of this season. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk with a couple of guys who mm, haven't had it quite so good. Stay with us. We're back at Daytona, where five months ago the Winston Cup season started with such high hopes for Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt, and since then, yeah, those boys have spent most of their time struggling. Okay, Wallace, you were so optimistic when we went to Daytona for the 500. Lots of great quotes about all the good things to come. A specific prediction of the championship, and since then it's been downhill. So what's the mid-season assessment? Well, I I'm very, very optimistic. I was optimistic going in and I still got to be optimistic I can't say oh it's not gonna work we can't do it although that's what it looks that's what it's looking like right now we're so far behind the points it's unbelievable but I don't quit uh, we're midway through the year right now I do, we just got to struggle and struggle strong get all the points we possibly can get as high as we possibly can but I'll tell you what if you don't win the championship you know finishing second third and fourth really doesn't mean a lot what means a lot to me is how many races I can win if I can lay a lot of numbers on the board lead a lot of laps, win a lot of races, uh, be up front all the time, that's important to me. Now, yeah, I want to win a championship, and it's looking uh, rough right now, but uh, I'm not much for excuses, you know, I want to fix the problem. Uh, and I'm, I'm almost embarrassed about some of the weird things that have happened to us this year. Very, very embarrassed coming out here in the Daytona 500, uh, finishing second in the clash, running great in the 125. Very, very optimistic that there's a good chance, my best chance to win the Daytona 500. And I go out so early with a blown motor, nobody knew we were in the race. Heck, I, I had time to take a shower in a motorhome, go back to this house we were staying at, and watch the last three quarters of the race. So, and it was just like, I can't believe this happened, I can't believe this happened. Well, I've said that a couple times this year. And uh, we just got to make some changes and get things better. Uh, the engine room is on kill right now, trying to get, turn everything around. We've leased some motors from Larry Wallace this year. While, and that's enabled our guys to work hard at trying to get our own stuff where it's supposed to be. And he's built great engines for us, and we've run really good with them. And now Mike Aggie has built some great engines again for us. Uh, went down to Daytona, qualified well. Uh, we've uh, getting all the short track engines strong. Just got a phone call a little while ago that, boy, our new engine for the Loud New Hampshire race is just awesome. So things are looking up. You know, I get the idea maybe you need two report cards. There's one for team attitude, and that looks pretty good. The one for your actual ranking in the point standings maybe is not so hot. 
Oh, yeah, attitudes a lot better than points. I, I mean, you, you can interview me at the end of the year, and I'm going to tell you the same story. I got all the intentions in the world to win all the race I possibly can. If I can get the, the equipment to hang with me and the motors to hang with me and everybody stay as optimistic because I stay optimistic, we'll win them all. And they, they want to win them all. So I'm not a quitter. I never do. I get embarrassed every now and then about saying some things that we're going to go out there and kick some ass, and it doesn't happen. Uh, but I said that a lot, and it has happened, too. <laughs> Well, from Rusty Wallace, we set our sights on Dale Earnhardt, and guess what? <laughs> we missed. We asked him if he'd like to come talk about the first half of his season, and he said, no. Surprise you? No, not really, because when I used to lose all the time, I'd walk in the garage area and see the media, the TV camera, or I'd go around behind a truck, because I didn't want to talk to anyone. And when you're old for 43 or 42 or whatever, yeah, you don't want to talk to anybody. Trust me, they will continue to work to turn that string around. Now, while Earnhardt continues to struggle, Ricky Rudd continues a streak of which he is much more proud of Dover. He claimed the victory, his 15th consecutive year in which he's won a Winston Cup race, and he's looking forward to the second half of 97. Well, I think a realistic goal for us is be, would be able to finish third in the point standings this year. We're, we're eighth. We're currently less than 100 out of fifth. Third is, would be a pretty big you know, you know, adventure, I guess, if we could accomplish that. We're really looking at 1998, and uh, you know, each year when you have a major uh, distraction like crew chief changes or engineer changes or whatever the key people in the organization, whether it be motor program changes, you take a setback. You, you take one step back, you regroup, and this is sort of a regrouping year for us. Even though we're having more success this year than we have in many years, uh, we really look at building this thing for 98. We've got all the key people will be in place for 98, so this is kind of the foundation year for next year. But not sitting there saying, well, I'm going to give up 1997. You know, we're trying very hard in 97, but uh, a realistic top three in the point standings would be uh, was, is a real possibility we see. From Rudd's streak, let's turn to the sometimes sputtering Dale Jarrett and his championship effort. Everything seemed right on track, then a couple of blown motors, and boom, fourth in the points. We've had our uh, bad races, and, and so I have to make sure that I don't do anything on the racetrack that's going to cause us to have another bad race. We can't afford any more bad finishes. Uh, our finishes have to be at, at least in the top ten, but the majority in the top five. And so I've got to be really smart, and, and Todd and I have to work together to, to ensure that when we start the races uh, on race day that, that we're in good shape, something that we can adjust with and give ourselves a chance to win. Before we leave Yates Racing, let's talk about the single most emotional moment of the 97 campaign. It had to be Ernie Irvin beating the track at Michigan that nearly took his life. There's there's no doubt that, um, you know, this is a win that is, is very emotional. And, um, you know, I remember being here, you know, like three years ago. and um, But I don't remember being here on Sunday. And, um, you know, this is a, a great time. And um, being able to be here, and um, it was a pretty emotional win just, uh, you know, because of all the thoughts of what's going on. Two of the biggest moments of the first half of this season were the openings of Texas Motor Speedway outside Dallas-Fort Worth and the California Speedway in Fontana, just east of Los Angeles. Gordon winning there, of course, was business as usual, his 26th career victory. But Jeff Burton claimed his very first Winston Cup checker in Texas and reminded us once again that there is no win quite like the first one. How about it, BP? I'll bet you remember the first one. Sure do. It was uh, South Boston, Virginia, 1971. Mother's Day, as a matter of fact, and about 1,500 people showed up. Jeff Burton won. 150,000 showed up. <laughs> Big moment in his career. He's got a lot to say about this 1997 campaign. Give a listen. Report card for you and your team on the first half. I'd have to give us an A for our performance. Um, our performance has been wonderful. We run in the top ten about everywhere we've been. Uh, with the exception of the 24 and the beginning of the year, the 88, we've been as good as and as consistent as any team out there. The six has been just a touch better. Uh, the last six or seven races, they seem to beat us by three or four spots. So I'd give us an A. Um, but on the other end, I'd have to give us a C for, because we've had three races where we haven't finished uh, because of mechanical problems. So in those three races, that that's why we're not higher in the points than we are. Is that you? You can't, you can't fall out of races, whether it be for wrecks or mechanical problems or, or any reason, and, and expect to win a championship. Uh, you're allowed maybe two problems a year at three at the most. We've had our three. Now we've got to, we've got to hold them to a minimum. Who makes that happen? Who holds it all together? And specifically, 
what role do you as a driver, a young driver, play in that role? Well, I, I think Jack Roush and Buddy Parrott and, and, and myself, all three, have to hold it together. Uh, we have to, Buddy is probably because he on a daily basis has to deal with the problems and with the good things and so, so he's got the hardest job. Now, my job is, uh, is pretty well defined. It's pretty easy to, to say what I do. It's not easy to do, unfortunately, but it's, uh, my job is all about speed. Uh, my deal is what can we do to the race car and what can we do to Jeff Burden to go fast and to go fast for a long period of time. Um, that's my job in a nutshell. And, and if that's going to the wind tunnel with the team and, and relaying information to them about what I feel versus what the wind tunnel said, uh, the dyno, what the dyno says, what the, what the driver feels, that's all part about being a driver. It's not just sitting behind the wheel, showing up at a racetrack and driving the car and saying it's pushing, fix it. Uh, those days are gone. I think they're gone. I think the days where the driver's input and the driver's understanding of, of all the data that we're collecting through computer acquisition, all the data through dynos and wind tunnels, all that boils down to the driver's butt and what he feels in the race car. And, and if you can't relay that information and, and give that to your team, then I don't know how successful you can be. Now that there's a little space to reflect on it, look back on Texas and what that meant, what that felt like, what it means now that it's not such a recent memory. I'm, uh, maybe I'm a pessimist, I don't know. I, I, I haven't got, let myself get very worked up about Texas. Um, a lot of people around me have gotten worked up, up and, and, and it is an exciting thing, and I'm not trying to downplay it. But what I don't like, my fear was that, okay, we've won, great year. This team's better than that. Uh, this, our sponsor, XI, deserves more than that. Our car owner deserves more than that. I'm not saying we'll go out and win five races at the end of the year, but what I'm saying is when you win a race, your first race as a driver and as a team together in the sixth race of the year, man, there's 24 races left. That, your year's not made. Now, you've done a great thing, and you've done a thing that, that millions of people have seen you do, and, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but there's so much more to accomplish that you have to downplay it some because if you don't, for a young team and a young driver like myself, you could lose focus. And uh, we can't afford that. We, my, my car on a, on a daily basis almost reminds me that we can win the Winston Cup Championship. And you can't win the Winston Cup Championship just because you won a race. You win the Winston Cup Championship because you finish third some days, you finish fifth some days, you take a 15th place car and you make a ninth out of it. That's how you win Winston Cup Championships. You don't win it by winning one single race. Purely from a driver viewpoint, when you look at the guys in front of you, I mean, Gordon, Jarrett, reel off the list. Do you see them doing things that you can't do yet? If, if you guys all got in the same car and, and went out and cut laps, would you be the fastest guy? How does your mind work in, in terms of comparing your own, just your personal ability, not the team, sure. what you can do with a race car with those other guys? I don't compare my driving skills against anybody because I'm going to do the very best I can do and I'm going to try to learn from my mistakes, and I'm going to try to emulate myself with a Mark Martin, somebody, a Terry Labonte, someone of that caliber. And I, and I do compare myself, but I try to beat them at, at setting up race cars, uh, helping with the shocks, uh, all that stuff. I try to be smarter than those guys because I spend more time at it than most people do because I'm able to. The more success you have, the less time you have to spend with your race team. And that's a little bit backwards, but that's just the way it is. Uh, because I'm kind of the newcomer into this thing of, of being somewhat successful, I'm gonna use the time I have to help my race team and to help do what we need to do to win races and to win championships. And, and I think the way I've been brought up and every time I've been successful, I've been a part of, of a winning team, not separate of the team as a driver coming in just to drive. So that, that's, that's where I put my focus is, is how I can help the team rather than how I drive compared to someone else. You know, BP, it just dawned on me, there's a link there. You won your first race at South Boston. He's from South Boston. Exactly right. But now he lives in Mooresville, North Carolina. Move from his hometown to be closer to that race car. Again, that's what we're talking about by commitment. Burton's got his first victory. There are some very good race car drivers in this series looking for their first victory in the second half of 97. We'll hear from them when we come back. 
Now let's talk about John Andretti, who closed the first half of the season with his first career Winston Cup victory. Pretty impressive win indeed. Led the most laps of the Pepsi 400. On the final restart, he had to outbox a pretty foxy guy in Dale Earnhardt and then hold off Terry Labonte to score that first career victory. You know, I've been saying that this team is the best, especially when the restrictor play racing comes, and um, we've been saying it, and um, now today we proved it, and I'm just... Anybody could have driven the car. I feel great about what these guys have done. I mean, Kelly Yarborough, you know, put a lot of faith in me, and, um, you know, there's been a lot, of, a lot of talk and things going on, but today we came through and got the first win for Kelly Yarborough Motorsports, and it um, feels great. And that leads us to an impressive group of drivers from whom we expect that first win at any time. Let's hear first from Jeremy Mayfield. We got a race team, a solid race team, and a, a very good race team, and um, that's something that a lot of people, you know, work hard to get because we've got the parts and pieces and, and motors and chassis and bodies. We've got all that stuff, but it's hard to get a good solid race team and with a good, you know, a good group of people around you. And it seems like we've had that, but now we've, we've kind of pulled all together and, and we're, we're all for one and one for all right now instead of just, you know, a bunch of people working on, on cars. We're a good solid group right now. Until his crash in last week's Pepsi 400, Michael Waltrip had completed 99% of the laps raced this year. For young Waltrip, running all those laps means moving closer to that elusive first victory. It really doesn't drive me crazy. Um, I'm, I'm very realistic about where I've been and, and my situation. So uh, um, I know I could have won a couple of races. Uh, could I have won 10 or 12? No. That bothers me more than the fact that I haven't won one. Uh, I tell people all the time, statistically speaking, I'm pretty much screwed either way you look at it. If I win one, I'm one for 350. I mean, who cares? You know, I'm going to have to go on a row and win a bunch of them before it's really going to matter. Uh, and the fact that I haven't won a race or two, when I know in my heart there's been three or four that were mine, I could have won them and things didn't go right. And I also know there's people that have won two or one or two races that, you know, um, they're not as good a driver as me. So the fact that they've got that win in their, or that mark in their win column uh, doesn't bother me at all because I'm happy with uh, the job I can do in a race car. Well, it's been a high-speed learning process for all these drivers. Now it's time to take those lessons from the first half back to the track for the second half. Like I say, the first half is pretty much over now, so it's looking back saying we can't change nothing, but we can learn from it. And we did learn. We took a uh, car that we thought, well, it's a pretty decent car, and we ran second at Darlington with it. So we took it to Texas and was running fifth, had a little motor trouble there. So we said, you know, this might not be a bad car. And bingo, all of a sudden, that thing is running in the top five. We ran it at Pocono, we ran it at Michigan, we ran it at California with real good results. Second half, hey, when we go back to Pocono, to Michigan, and, and on down the line like that, that car's coming back. And we'll take it back to Darlington, maybe we can get the win with it. But uh, like I say, there's sometimes you get a real good car, you know, I don't know, say magic car, Sometimes you get a car that just seems to, no matter what you do, it's a real good car for any little setup you put in it, it runs good. We're going to run the heck out of that car, and hopefully the second half will produce something good for us. Uh, from my past history, and we really faltered last year, but uh, 1995, we were in the top five in the point things for a very long time, and I believe wound up seventh overall at, at the end of the season. 1997, if I can do that again, uh, you know, and improve on it, I want to be in the top five in the point standings with a win this year. If I can do that, I'd say 1997 was a successful year, and then grow on that for 1998. You know, just keep building with new people and new team I've got, you know, and the crew chiefs and stuff like that. We're starting to build this little empire right now. If, like I say, if I can get to that plateau, get a top five in the point standings with a win this year, I'd say, okay, that's a pretty good mark to hit, and then let's move on from there for 1998. So with all the reporters always coming around asking when it's going to happen, how important is that first win? I very much, I, I want to win bad, and, but, you know, we will win when we're ready. We'll win when we have a nearly perfect day, and, and I've come to realize that that's going to be as, of a result of having lead laps, getting used to running up front. Rusty, Mark, Dale, Jeff, Terry, these guys are the best, and you need to have, you need to have been in that position a few times before you can capitalize on it. You know, and if we ran, if we ran okay five races in a row, and all of a sudden we're in a great position to win, 
we may not be able to do it because we, we haven't got the experience of knowing how to deal with those guys in the closing laps, you know, the knockout punch, so to speak. But it's all about progress. And if that win came this weekend, great. But it's really more important for when that win comes for us to have won because we were the best and, and, we, were, and we were ready to win because then we won that second, third, fourth. Hey, guys, if you're ever tempted to get down in your pursuit of that elusive first victory, just ask John Andretti how good it feels. The NASCAR Winston Cup midseason pit stop has been brought to you by Cooper Tires. Drive on. And by Quaker State, the quality your car deserves. All right, we're back at Daytona USA to wrap up this NASCAR Winston Cup midseason pit stop. As with most of these shows, Benny, I suspect we probably raised more questions than we've delivered answers. But we had questions about drivers and teams. I've got bigger questions to ask, Dave. Like what? Well, like, how many races are we going to run in 1998? You asking me? Uh, 30-some? <laughs> exactly. And how many more $100 million racetracks are going to be built across the United States? A lot of growth. A lot of question about how big we can get. I got a question for this guy. I heard you on RPM tonight say that this has become a four-driver race. The famous Alan Kowicki statistic, 278 points behind after Dover, came back and won the championship. How can you eliminate the guys from fifth on back? It's easy. He only had two cars to leap over to get to the championship. Now if you're 278 points back, you've got to leap over four or five cars to get to the championship. Once again, the expert always has the answer. And so I ask you the final question of the night, which is, which of those four guys is going to win the championship? I don't know. That's the same answer you gave me when I asked you that question at the Daytona 500 five months ago. I have no clue who's going to win the championship. I will tell you this. It's going to be very exciting to watch, and you'll see a bunch of it on ESPN. We appreciate you being here. Good luck to all the teams as they enter the second half of this season. For Benny Parsons, I'm Dave Despain. That's it from Daytona, USA, and the NASCAR Winston Cup midseason pit stop.